Kelly Gorsuch is a serial entrepreneur, master stylist, and barber, and educator with 27 years of experience and current owner of two barbershops and salon. Today, we're going to get to know, know him and how he got to where he is. Welcome back to the Hairdresser Strong Show. I'm your host, Robert Hughes, and today I'm with Kelly Gorsuch. How are you doing today, Kelly? I'm well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thanks again for coming on the show. Really appreciate having you. So uh, I just wanted to like kind of start off by hearing your story. I know that it's uh, we had a little pre-conversation earlier and uh, it's very dynamic and it moves around. And I think that's awesome because a lot of a lot of people I talk to, they want to understand different pathways and career pathways um, when they're thinking about planning out their future. So why don't you give us a little uh, background information? Um, OK, I, I don't really. Uh... I'm just going to preface with I'm not great about talking about myself. So if I hang up, it's not because I'm trying to figure it out. It's because uh, I'm trying to do it the most humble way possible. Um, one, I grew up in a family full of hairdressers. My siblings are hairdressers. My parents are hairdressers. I've been around the industry my entire life, even though I didn't think I was going to get into it. Um, I ended up in it at the end. Um, I started when I was 17. I went to Graham Webb um, International. Uh, which was in Washington, D.C., and then I bounced around a little bit between Florida and D.C. working and ended up kind of in my apprenticeship. Um, not an apprenticeship. I didn't really apprentice. I uh, touched, uh, I apprenticed a little bit behind my dad, not a, not a lot, and then, um, uh, and then I kind of did more of the teaching thing. I, t I taught with Sebastian, Tony, and Guy, and um, and another company, Russ for a second. No, yeah, Russ for I touched on Russ for like a minute. It was nothing. Um, and then uh, a little bit of Bumble and Bumble. Um, so kind of bounced around a little bit, a uh, bit teaching. Tony guy was like the longest one that I worked for, and then um, and then I kind of settled down and and I was doing a little bit of runway and editorial work at the time. And I just was kind of done with traveling. So I decided to, to go to a salon atmosphere and try to like become the best I could be inside of uh, the Washington DC community. Um, and so this is where my apprenticeship started. I apprenticed under uh, a guy named um, Frank. Um, oh my God, I can't remember his last name, Frank. Anyway, he owns Molecule in Washington DC and St. Germain. I, um, he may, may not own one of those anymore, but um that's kind of where I apprenticed he kind of taught me like um a different perspective on the industry up until that time the industry was kind of cheesy and this is the first time I kind of worked in a salon where I felt like you know they gave the the industry the respect it deserved and I'm forever grateful for that even though like you know like all things I was young when I worked for him and um and you know I probably didn't see it well enough at the time but that's where I got my apprenticeship. And this is what I always tell these kids today is like, you have to be okay making someone else wealthy, you know, and, and that the only way to become a good owner and, and figure out what your voice is, is to apprentice under someone else. And you have to see like how hard the decisions actually are when you have money on the line, because it's really easy to go up to an owner and, and ask them questions. And, um, and like, you think it's the smartest thought ever because it's from your perspective, but they're thinking from the perspective of everybody in there. They don't get to make a, a decision that's based on one perspective. And that's really difficult to wrap your head around when you're young, but as you age and mature, you start to understand it and see it a little bit more. Um, did you learn that? they have to take everybody. Did you learn that on, um, in your apprenticeship program? Um, or is that coming yeah it, well I mean I I call it an apprenticeship it wasn't actually an apprenticeship I was literally managing this guy's salon and doing all okay. of this I was running his training program um so I wasn't literally apprenticing I was a pre I was uh the teacher of apprentices so I was running a program gotcha. that was the first location I was teaching people um and we were trying to build it up and that salon became you know the best salon in DC like overnight it was insane um yeah, and it was, I mean, it was amazing that, so that salon uh, just broke off into so many other good salons and, and when it kind of not came down, cause it's still there, but 
when it kind of moved away from this one direction, um, you know, it kind of broke off into some really good salons. Interesting. And uh, so I want to actually come back to that. So I'm just going to write mm -hmm. this little note. Um, but I want to continue with your story. Um, but mm -hmm. okay, so so you you kind of moved around a little bit. You and then you started. So you were on the floor in in Florida and a salon and a high end salon in Florida. And then you you came you came back to DC and you started managing and teaching and working with this salon. And all the time, were you edu while you were at um, Molecule? Were you uh, still teaching for another company at that time, or were you just actually? I taught. Um, for Tony and Guy at the time. And then I was moving to Bumble and Bumble during that, during my time at Molecule. Um, and then after that, after I left this salon, that's when I stopped teaching because I became an owner and I just didn't have the time anymore. Well, I, I stopped teaching outside the salon. I, I started teaching um, so, exclusively inside the salon. Okay. I, All right. My entire career, even, like even when I first hit the floor, I've always had an apprentice. So I've never, even when I was like a, a young teenager, I've always had an apprentice. And so there's never been a time where I've been in this industry where I wasn't teaching. Gotcha. Okay. That's interesting. So uh, when you got out of school, did you have to do an apprenticeship or were you able to get right on the floor? I apprenticed, I taught, I apprenticed a little bit at my dad's salon, but it was so far away that um, I didn't really go much, but uh I apprenticed a little bit at the salon in, in Florida. And when I moved back, um, I went straight to the floor. Okay. Uh, which was a really, really bad idea. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, because you shouldn't, I, I mean, the problem is in our industry, I really believe schools have a really difficult job of teaching you how to be a hairdresser from a chair perspective. And, and it's not their fault. It's really difficult to learn this. I believe apprenticeships are necessary or else you're out there just destroying people's hair. I mean, there's just no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and All I right. did it too. <laughs> so, uh, so you're, when you said after molecule, you became a salon owner. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Like, what was that whole process? Like, uh, you know, how'd you make the decision? Like, how'd you come up, come to the point, come to the point where you were like, you knew you wanted to ha open a salon. Was there any like, fear or uncertainty or doubt about it and the yeah moment. i mean you like yeah all the emotions right um well one so this is difficult because typically when i say like people start saying like uh the salon is toxic which is like uh rampant in our industry i always have to remind them that the building doesn't become toxic they do um and this salon got toxic for a minute um and it was like right. it was actually ownership was involved hairdressers were involved um it wasn't like the owner was out and the salon was getting toxic this is one of the few cases in my career where actually the salon itself was like a little toxic for a hot second and it freaked people out because we had seen what it could be for years and um and then everyone just at one time like I, there was three groups in there that just went and did their own salon and a couple people came to me and they talked me into it obviously um I, I don't really want to do it and uh because like I said I I, I don't want I still to this day don't want to be a number one and um I I think there's just too much stress in salon ownership and then um and so and I knew it from the beginning because my parents were hairdressers and and I just I got talked into it <laughs> and, and then by the end of it, I had a new partner and my other two partners were out. And so by the time the salon opened, I, I was renting a, a chair at a, a salon for a minute, which was like one of the worst experiences of my life because I was, I've always looked at myself as a very high end upscale hairdresser. And I rented a shop because it's hard to, it was, especially in Washington, DC, it was hard to rent chairs at that time in decent shops and it still is today. And, um, you know, and so I had to rent a chair and, and work around hairdressers I probably didn't want to work around. So weirdly, this was the worst time of my life. And it was simply because I was around people I didn't believe in. And I just really didn't like it. I wasn't comfortable with it. But I believed in their vision. I believed in the voice that they wanted to do, you know, like most people open salons because of ego and, 
And these guys, you know, like wanted to do it because they had a different voice. They had a different vision in the way that they wanted it to work. And, and it made sense. And so I was on board and they were a couple and it just, their, their relationship, um, opening a business is very stressful and their relationship declined while we were in it. And then I had to have, I had to get someone to buy them out by the end of it. So I opened up with another, um, with another partner named Melanie, um, and and then we just had seven years of, to go at it with uh, Urban Style Lab, you know, and it was my first salon and I did things very differently and, you know, and, uh, and it was just, it was a ball, you know, it was the hardest time of my life building up um, from scratch. In fact, a lot of people think there's so much money in salon ownership, but it was 13 years before I made more money than I made behind the chair. Wow. 13, 13, years. 13 years from, from the day I owned to the till I made more money than I made behind the chair because what people don't realize a lot of times in salon ownership is they think there's so much money but if you remove yourself from the scenario that's not true there's very little money in it it's just that you are in almost always the owner is in the business well that's not a viable business it's only viable if you can remove the salon owner and the place could stay open Right. I mean, the only the oldest salon I can think of in America is Bumble and Bumble in New York City and they're owned by Estee Lauder. So, right, <laughs> like, right. like like at the end of the day, they don't last very long and you, don't, you there's no such thing as legacy. No one there's no legacy. I mean, but also soon is probably the closest thing to legacy in our industry. And he's gone, gone. Right. Yeah, like it's gone. The, the average person has no idea what but also soon did. Hairdressers kind of have an idea that he made repeatable haircuts and stuff, but like at the end of the day, like there's better hairdressers in our industry and you don't even know them, you know, yeah. like my, I talk about people all the time and, and, and like, you know, and people never heard of them and they're like 10 years old. I mean, it's not like, it was just 10 years, the, like the shift from 10 years ago to now is just insane, insane you know, like so, the, some of the best hairdressers alive today or some of the best hairdressers that have ever lived are alive today and no one knows who they are. That's crazy to me. Yeah. So why do you think that is? Um, dude, I don't know. I mean, because maybe they weren't as good at Instagram as other people, right? Yeah, like they were out of that age yeah. bracket, right? You almost skipped a generation of people. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and I mean, whose fault is that? There's no one's fault. It's just like the way the world, the crookie crumbled, you know, but um, yeah. So uh, I want to go back to something uh, you were talking about how when you uh, when you were renting a chair. So I guess that's the in between stage before you opened up Urban Style Lab. Yeah, yeah, that was during the build out. Yeah, because and, uh, you know he found out that we were running the salon and fired all of us, which I don't blame him for because we should have yeah. we should have done the right thing and told him. Right, because it could have ended up the same result anyway. <laughs> I mean, he could have fired us, but at least yeah. you have your dignity. At least you right. have your integrity you know? Right, right, right. Um, you know, I've made my mistakes for sure. So uh, when you were at this renting a chair, um, so I just want to kind of open up, open up on some, um, open up something. You were saying how it was the worst experience that you had. And it had to do with you weren't like, you weren't really surrounded by people that uh, you had a say in who you were working with. And so like, they weren't like inspiring, you weren't really inspired there. Uh, can you just kind of like for people who, um, you know, your experience as a boot as a chair renter, uh, something to like any any pieces of advice or, or heads up that you would want to give to somebody that is thinking about taking that move? Oh my money. God, this is, this, this is an episode in itself. Um, the one thing I'll say, reverse engineer your career. Start with where you want to end up and what you want to accomplish. Okay. Because if it's high end, that's not for you. If it's low end, it's probably not for you. But if, if you want to be a middle of the road hairdresser, like I, I can see a path there. Um, you may not like that path though. At, at the end of the day but um you know just being honest about it like you're not going to be high end in a rental scenario because you have no say in who works beside you or who gets who gets attached to the name of that brand right even even salon uh studios have a brand 
And everyone that works in there is contributing to that brand. And if you can't control that, if there's no voice, if there's no like direction, there's no art direction, right? <clears throat> that's just going to hurt you in your career. And no matter how much you think that's going to help you, it's not. It's going to hurt you because it's going to limit and put a bar on how much you can charge. Say your potential was to be a $200 cutter, right? You're never going to get there in a place where you don't learn to be a $200 cutter. You're like, you're cutting your feet out from under you right off the bat. And then on the vice versa, on the low end, I just don't contemplate, like, I don't see how, like, I don't see how this works in a, in a way where um, you get benefits, you get health insurance, you're, you're contributing to your, it's just not possible on a low end in a rental scenario. Like, I just don't, I, I don't see it. Like, you're better off in a company that's big who's going to pay your health care and, um, you know, you're going to share. The, the trick to this whole thing is very simply uh, salon ownership is not salon ownership. It's not like some guy with a top hat counting cash in the back room, stacks and stacks of money going through his coins and swimming in, in his ocean of bank account, right? Like, that's not what it is. Really, you have to look at it like as a village leader. And he is just making decisions based on the whole, everybody's contributing to that. So you're protecting yourself with desk people. So you're not having to do that. You're having shampoo people. So you're not having to do that. All of these things are to help increase your wealth because if you have a cancellation, the desk person should be trying to figure out how to get somebody in that to make you more money. The shampoo people should be able to get, get you through shampoos while you're working on someone else. Your apprentices should be able to catch you up so you can work faster and and maybe even double book, right? I double booked for a large portion of my career where I was doing two haircuts every hour at $300. You can only do that with apprentice. You can't do that outside of that, right? So, you know, you know it's very simple to me. It's, you have to reverse engineer your career and try to figure out um, by looking at it and being honest about it, right? Like, what do you want to contribute to the community? Because you're not going to do that single, singly. You're... Uh, I don't, I don't know how to say that. You're not going to do that by yourself because you're likely to be more narcissistic. You're going to be thinking about you and buying nice cars and nice things and nice apartments and nice houses. And you're not going to be creating jobs. You're not going to be passing on the knowledge of the industry, which is incredibly important, right? I didn't get into this industry to just get rich. I got into this industry to be a part of the community, to be a part of something, to, to be around people who are like-minded. So my life mattered. Um, I didn't get in it to work in a, a prison cell. And <laughs> this is what I like to call studio. And, um, and like simply from the perspective of my experience, the two times I've rented chairs, both times while I was building out salons, um, you're around maniacs. It's just the truth. Like <laughs> you're just around a lot of people that you didn't choose to be beside you. And it's no fun. They're yelling at each other for borrowing brushes or borrowing hair product or just getting too close to each other or whatever. And it's like, just like a lot of strange infighting that is insane. And it, and like, you know, it's what people outside of our industry look at our industry as, and, and I don't want to be a part of it. Never have. Um, so you have to figure out for yourself, like what you want. And I'm not saying that it, there's probably, well, first of all, if we just take pure data from this, I think like only 30% of all people make it more than a year in it. Right. So just taking pure data, in general, no, 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 no. 30% make it from booth rental past year one oh, or, okay. or suite rental or any of that only 30%. So three out of 10, right. Make it past one year. So if we're looking at it like just purely off of data, it's probably a really stupid decision to, to, to go that direction. Um, maybe one out of 10, it works for for some time. I would say that like, dude, you're probably not seeing many people retire from that atmosphere. Like yeah. you're just not, you know, because like the, at the end of the day, you don't own a business, you own a job, which means that if you were to get hurt for four months and can't work, you're still paying rent. You're still, you still have all the expenses of the business. You have no income, right? So you don't own a business. You own a job. What about, you know? um, what about, uh, I'm just completely devil's advocate here. Do um, it. So, I love it. Um, so I, what about like, if you, I hear what you're saying. And um, if you have uh, business insurance, you should be, and you get injured, you should be able to get all your expenses covered. Uh, and if you have like short-term disability, 
uh, you should be able to get that covered. But I think the the biggest challenge in that would be the your actual book. Like, where do you what happens? How do you, what? Where do your clients go? Like, you don't you know. I I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. Like, a one, how many people are actually insured, right? Like, that's probably one in a hundred. So, which is like, crazy. I don't, I don't look. The one thing I'll say about me and my brain is I don't work in the anomalies. I work in percentages, right? So. You can't tell me just because one person was successful that the thing is good. It's not that right. that, that doesn't right. work for me. Um, you know, and so I look at it as a whole. Does it either help the industry or does it hurt the industry? And to me, it's a completely separate industry and it's very um, narcissistic and it's not giving back and it's not passing knowledge and it's not helping people long term. It's great for you in your 20s and 30s. Great. But once you get past that, well, you can't cut hair forever. You got to be able you got to be able to have employees so you can then retire. I, 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 this conversation, um, i want to finish up with your story, but yeah. I'm, I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm going to say that I'm going to put this down as the conversation we have, the next conversation we have, because this conversation, in my opinion, is the biggest conversation of our industry right now. But let, let's, yeah. let's, let's circle back to this. Um, I'm just going to write this business model. Uh, okay. So let's jump. Okay. So you're, you open up urban style lab and how long did you own urban style lab for? Uh, I think it was about seven years. Okay. And you said it took 13 years until you made more money. So that means the entire time you were at urban style lab, you weren't making more money. You were making I wasn't less making money. more money than I made behind the chair, behind the chair at, 18, right. at 18 years old. Like okay. that's as simple as that. Right. Like at 18, I was made, I made more money at 18 than I made again until i was in my 30s okay so that's very interesting so then you moved on and then what what'd you do uh you from urban style lab you what was your next move yeah Ur urban was a, a bit of a chore building your first one in a new city is is no easy task um you know it, it's the most fun you'll ever have but it's also the hardest thing you'll ever go through um you won't know it's fun until later <laughs> that's the one thing i'll say um so then my partner and I split and I literally sold out for peanuts. I sold out for like no money. And then I had to um, take a loan from nefarious sources, we'll say. And then I started my first solo salon and that was uh, Immortal Beloved. And we just put it in this like kind of mechanic shop on a side street. You wouldn't even, like, we didn't even have a sign. You wouldn't even know we were there. It was an 18-chair salon. And um, I don't know how I packed 18, 18 chairs in there. And um, and that just blew up, man. It was like one year, and then we were slammed. And it, it was just insane. Nice. Um, what do you I mean, the space was that? dope. But, um, direction, having one singular voice, okay. right? Like, you didn't have two partners com with competing voices. You had one singular unified voice and you had a direction and a purpose. And, you know, if you can come to work, I mean, look, we had hairdressers that, you know, moved on with time that didn't fit that direction. And that's how salon should be. You, you, they're, they're not perfect. You, people should be moving in and out of them constantly. You should be constantly trying to, to create, to, to be surrounded by people with the direction and, and the feeling of hairdressing that you want to be around. And yeah. that shop, uh, that shop epitomized it. We had some of the best hairdressers um, I've ever worked with. Nice. So then what happened from there? How long did you have that? And then what was the next move? Uh, we, ha I had that one for, man, I don't even know all this stuff. This stuff is a blur, but it was a few years. Um, I think I had it for, like three, four-ish years. Okay. And then I, um, I got so busy in this shop. And, and I, during this time, I started to develop what type of salon owner I wanted to be. And it went from, you know, when I first opened the salon, I was like something that was very counterintuitive to the way I believe. Um, I just was like, let hire hairdressers that did everything, um, you know, and let them do whatever and just step back and, and be around good people. And, um, and I hated it. <laughs> and so the next few years I spent trying to get people to focus, pick one, pick cutting color. If you colored, I wanted you to do a specific style of color. Uh, painting wasn't out yet. Right. So 
um, at this time, it was like people were doing vivids or they were doing micro weave highlights or they were doing um, real PC wax highlighting. There was like all kinds of like some people were doing balayage, but it was kind of it was kind of more of a French technique. It hadn't like turned into what it what we refer to now as painting. Um, hadn't really turned into that, but we were like on the beginning stages of that. And uh, it, and the salon just kind of uh, took a life of its own because I had people in it that only wanted to do men's hair. And I had people in it that only wanted to do women's hair. Like I hate doing men's hair. And, um, and it's not that I hate it. I just don't like being around a lot of men that want to pay the prices I was charging at that time. First of all, you're in Washington, D.C., so you're around powerful, rich people. And yeah. um, I think I stopped char I stopped taking men at $200. So the type of guy that was charging, paying $200 for a men's haircut, uh, not the type of guy you want to hang out with for like an hour at a time, for the most part. They're anomalies, obviously. Um, so now I had like four or five dudes in the salon, a couple girls that, that only did men. And, um, and they became like, what we now know as the barber stylist, that, that movement of barbering. Um, so grooming lounge existed. They're the grandfather of barbering. No one will ever take that away from them. They, they are the granddaddy of it all. And I mean, other people were still had barber shops, but these guys pushed the movement. Um, and it was the first time that you saw this barber styling movement it was the first time you saw uh, barbers learn female hairdressing techniques okay and and that's so up until this time in history barbers basically were really good at the sides and back and not so great at the top okay and so now you've added the techniques that allow you to cut the top into all these like very advanced techniques of women's hairdressing so you have this blend and I honestly had five, I think I had four, four or five, I can't remember now. I had four or five of my chairs taken up by people who only did barbered haircuts. And um, and I would just thought that I was losing money with it. So <laughs> I wanted to open up a barber shop just to get them out of there. And okay. and uh, and it's funny because I had Mike and I had Sowell and I had a couple really dope people um, that are still with me today and um, Lauren and and, and some of the guys and, and um, I can't remember if Jane was later and, and Nicole was there. And, you know, we just had this brilliant shop of barbers that were barber focused. So it made, it just made sense. It was like perfect uh, organic decision to just open up a barber shop. And honestly, I was just literally praying to break even. And, um, and because I just wanted to be able to put my my trained apprentices who are ready for the floor in their chairs. I mean, it's literally the whole deal. So I'm in the process of building this barber shop out and 14th Street, which at the time that I'm I'm on in Washington, DC, is empty. The entire street is vacant businesses, still burned out from like the 60s and 70s. Like the whole the whole area, you wouldn't, I couldn't even get people to come drink with me in that area. Um, which is like where the black cat is and stuff is today. Yeah. And, um, and then like, there was an article in, in the New York times, I think. And, um, and then like within a month, almost the entire street had, had uh, signed leases and I freaked out and I signed a lease on one of the last remaining properties on that street. Um, so now I had three, I'm carrying in three leases <laughs> and uh, which is really not smart. And, and so we opened up the barbershop and the barbershop was like an instant hit, man. Like I can't even explain it. I've never had anything like it. I'll never have anything like it again. It's just an instant hit. Mike, Mike and Soel and the guys and the gang, they did such a good job. And those guys were supposed to be partners. And then, um, and at the last minute they freaked out and didn't want to take the risk. And, um, and to this day, like, I wish they were partners and, and, you know, neither, neither one of them work for me anymore. So I'll work some, or I don't even think he cuts hair anymore, but he's on the West Coast and Mike's also in Portland and he's got his own shop now. And, uh, and you know, like the, the, it's just a difficult journey and it's scary and it's risky. And honestly, I, I, like I couldn't alleviate their fears. Like I was pretty sure it wasn't going to make money, uh, you know, and, and honestly, like it's a barbershop, so it's not going to, it's never going to kill, you know, but like, it's comfortable. And, um, like a lot of salon owners get into barbering and I try to like, 
I try to lobby them against it because it's really difficult for salon owners to, to, to manage barbers and, and barber shops in general. Uh, it's a totally different game and, and they have a hard time with that. And, um, and so that happened. And then soon as that opened, we were construction started at 14th street and we grew immortal from an 18 chair salon to like a 50 plus chair salon. And, nice. um, and it, and it was a behemoth. And honestly, yeah. I'll, I would, if I, I do have a 50 chair salon in Richmond, Virginia, but if I hadn't built that, I probably would never build that again. Like here, I'll never, I'll never pack it the way I packed DC. I just won't let that happen ever again. Um, it's just too much to uh, manage. There's too much inviting. Once you get past about six hairdressers, you start to form. There's a reason why Navy SEALs keep their groups in sixes, right? <laughs> like they've studied this to the ends of time. Once you get past six, you, you break off into factions. And anytime you have factions, you have inviting. And, um, and I don't care what the salon, how great their quote, it doesn't matter. Once you get past six, you're going to have inviting. And that's where ownership begins to suck. Um, and it's no fun. And because the thing too is if you have a common goal, like you start a salon and you're there to build it and everybody's like trying to build and get better and create a culture. Once the culture is built, well, now you have to maintain it. And that's where, that's where real salon ownership comes in. And, you know, cause up until then it's a honeymoon, it's fun, you know, but trying to maintain being the top in your city is a, a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. but that's it and then um you know in my journey i mean i've opened a lot of businesses since then and um i've gotten to like restaurant field i've gotten into construction i've gotten into you know just i'm, I'm in real estate and um like you know i own commercial properties and residential properties and i've gotten into a lot of stuff mostly i'm trying to get i'm trying to diversify especially since the pandemic trying to diversify into stuff that I don't need employees because employees are very difficult in today's world. Yeah. Uh, um, so this, uh, this is very dynamic and very awesome story with a lot of tons of detail. I really appreciate you sharing all this. Um, <clears throat> if uh, it like, I definitely want to expand on quite a few of these things. Um, but, but I would like to hear if uh so right now, so that so that's how you got to build the Immortal Beloved <clears throat> and the barbershop, which is Hell's Bottom. You build those brands. And as far as the industry goes, those are the two brands that you have right now. Is that right? That's it. And that's all I will ever have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, like both of them, like one, you know, Immortal for the longest time has been in the top 100 salons in the United States. And the barbershop is always in every top 10 list. And, and you know, like, I'm super proud of the brands and I, I'm not, I'm, I've never made a decision based on money. You know, I only do things that I, if I have to do them, period. And, and if I feel like my voice is needed, um, you know, cause I, I have no interest in doing something that other people have done. Like I, I never did like fantasy hair because, you know, people, um, people exist that are, that are better at that than I'll ever be. Like I, I don't have a vision. I don't have a, a voice in that. Right. Um, so it's just, you know, that's, you just have to figure out what you want to do in life and, and then, and be honest with yourself. Right. Because like, you don't need to do anything. You could go live a, an amazing life. Just being a hairdresser, man. If I could go back to 18 and work for Frank again and, and like, I would have made it work. Like I look back at every relationship I've ever had and I, and it's not that the girls were crazy. It's that I, I didn't, I just wasn't at a spot in my life where I wanted to make it work, right. you know, but now I look at, at salons like that too. I could have made it work and I could have been, you know, a better employee and I've apologized to everyone I've ever worked for, um, you know, because, because I was, uh, how do we put this? Um, I was young and I, I was egotistical and arrogant and I thought that my way was the only way and that um and that no one could do it better than me right and now I look back and I'm like damn like you don't need to be like that <clears throat> you don't you don't first of all everybody can do it pretty well right like it's not like you <laughs> it's not like <laughs> it's not like it won't get done it gets done every day all across the entire world right like hairdressing happens you know, so like to have that like ego to believe that you're the only one that can do it and do it well is just insane. And you see that in the salons and it's like, 
look, you may be the 1% that everyone else uh, is not as good at. You weren't, they didn't, they weren't born with your talent, but they're not, there's not something wrong with them, right? There's something right with you, right? Like you got lucky, you hit the jackpot. You know, you were born with a skill and a, and a, and a will and an, and in like a, an aptitude and, and a flexibility of, and, you know, and that some other people weren't, or at least they're not in that spot in their life yet. Right. And, it, and it's like there needs to be more empathy. We always hear our, in our industry, we're always talking about empathy. But in the in the daily environment, there's very little empathy for this. Very little empathy between hairdressers, between hairdressers, between hairdressers and shampoo people, between hairdressers and desk people, between hairdressers and owners, between hairdressers and clients. Right. Like just think about like one uh, one one policy. Um that illustrates this whole thing is like people's want to punish guests for not showing up. Yeah. Right. Like if you just look at that, like you start to look at how egotistical we are as an industry, like you're going to punish somebody for, for like missing an appointment, but you call out once a week, like literally hairdressers are a breed of people that call out like once a week on average. Right. They never yeah. ever think about the money that they're losing when they call out. Right right? Like they only think about the money that they're losing when the one person a, a day doesn't show up. And like, honestly, like that's built into the price. Like you just gotta, you gotta take the, the, the moment to sit down and read yeah. or, or double book. And, and then you don't have to worry about it. You just do like, I always had this thing where like, if you just, if you just sat in my chair by accident, I'm cutting your hair, you know, <laughs> like my job is to sit behind these two chairs. And if you put someone in those two chairs, my job is to cut it between the hours 11 and 8 that's my job right and i don't come in i'm not thinking about what i'm doing tonight i'm not thinking about my vacation i'm not thinking about the weekend i am a hundred percent present for my guests and if they're 10 minutes late makes no difference the clock doesn't matter to me this those schedules are are fluid right if they show up 15 minutes late i'm doing it if they show up 10 minutes earlier i'm doing it if, if, if they happen to come at the same time i got apprentices i'm doing them right i'll cut one get the other one shampooed yeah. Um, you know, I'll blow dry one, I'll cut the other one. Like it, it's simple to me. And it and like there's no reason to punish the people who are making your your dreams possible. I mean, just the concept of that is just so insane. I can't even like literally it's the one thing that also it's the one thing that drives me crazy about employees because they always come up to you and, and, and you're like, I've been in this for 27 years now, and they come up to you and they go, Have you ever thought about uh charging people for not showing up? And it's like, no, man. <laughs> like no of course not in 27 years i've never once thought about that you know and that's that like egotistical thing where you're like you're young and you think you know better and that like old people have never thought about the things you've thought about and all you realize like when you're later when you get a little older is you're like i'm just a young person who's now matured and have life experiences and i've and i've seen the decisions go different ways and i've seen the effects of those outcomes right um you know we live in a society that tends to value words and not outcomes and that you know as a business owner you don't get to do that yeah right? so just because it sounds pretty doesn't mean it works right so i think that that's a um a good place to uh kind of like start to wrap it up um what if you i feel like that might be it but um if you had any advice for somebody who's looking who's maybe in school and thinking that the they want to become a salon owner or a stylist who's thinking about becoming a salon owner. Uh, what would your advice to them be? I think the most important advice I could give anybody is, is don't be a salon owner. Um, and that's hard to hear from a salon owner. Cause you're going to think that like, I'm keeping you out of the end. That's not, there's so many, this is a big world, right? You have, there's plenty of room. Don't, don't do it unless you absolutely have to do it. Don't do it for ego. Don't do it because you think it's going to look good on Instagram. Like that is a recipe for heartache. And I'm going to tell you like, it's fun. Our industry is fun when you let it be fun. The second you're an owner, you're responsible for everything. So first reverse engineer the life you want, right? Sit down and be honest with yourself and try to figure out what you want out of the career, right? Because then that tells you, okay, do I want to be in a salon where we're giving back and we're training hairdressers and we're being a part of the community and we're actually paying our taxes 
right? Like, do I want to be a part of that? Or do I want to be a part of this thing that's very me centric? And it's only about the one hairdresser and their thing and, and their direction. And, and it doesn't have to contribute to the industry as a whole, which is, you know, man, if I'm looking at this industry, right, like that's the direction. And it's sort of heartbreaking. Um, because this industry is dope if you let it be dope. If you get into groups where you're all singularly focused and like-minded and you have a direction and you have the same cutting styles and everybody around you at the salon kind of looks like you and is trying to do the same cool things as you're trying to do, this industry is fantastic. But you have to start by reverse engineering what type of career you want. If you want to be like a great hairdresser, there's only one way to do it. you got to go apprentice in the best salon possible. They're not there, like they are 100% not there to, to, the thing that's true across all businesses, you're talking about sub 10% profit margins, right? I can tell you that the headache here is worth it. Give them the 10%, right? Because what people don't understand is they're like, oh yeah, booth rental, I can make all this money or suite rental, I can make all this money. Yeah, but if you do the, if you do it, if you break it down hourly, you're not making that much money because you're, we're, you're doing all the receptioning, you're doing all the invoices, you're doing all the shopping, you're doing all the cleaning, you're doing all the laundry, you're doing all, you're doing, you have no apprentices, right? There's no one to help you out at all. You're, you're paying accountants, you're paying tax lawyers, you're paying all of this stuff, you're paying taxes on the spot. You're paying some guy that pays $5 a square foot, like 150 a square foot for your space. Like, it, it, like it, it's mental. Go let, like, and all of the people that own those don't work in the industry. So you're just making people outside of the industry wealthy, right? So like, just be honest about what the industry is and, and, and what you want to accomplish and then go do it, go apprentice for someone. Don't open a salon until you apprentice a man, like manage for someone else. Don't, don't do it until you've trained, you've trained another human being, right? Because the only way to make, make it as a salon owner long-term is to teach because you need to like beat the attrition rate. And as schools have declined, right? Like the schools we went to and you taught for like no longer exist, mm -hmm. right? If you have no schools because everybody's doing like, because there's no money in the industry anymore, especially not on paper, right? Because if, if everybody's booth running, they're not claiming any taxes, right? So like, if you have this whole industry that can't prove wealth, like in, a, in a, some places in America are banning booth rental and suite rental, right? Because if you have these, they're, they're very rarely paying their taxes, right? So you're not contributing to the community. And, I, and I'm not shitting on, I'm just telling you how, how it is. And, and if you want to go pay taxes and like work by yourself, I, dude, I'm for it. If that's the type of hairdresser you, you want to be, right? Like that's all, has existed from the beginning of the time and will always exist. But be honest about the fact that like you'll never be upscale in that environment. It's just not possible. And, um, and, and that's okay for some people, but for, for most people who get into this industry and stay in this industry, because the numbers are really bad, right? Like I think only like 1% of all hairdressers retire from it, 10% make it 10 years. I mean, the numbers are staggeringly bad. It's not because there's a lot of good salons out there showing people how to make money or that there's that much wealth in this industry. We got to stop, like, we got to stop kidding ourselves and, and be honest as an industry. And, and that's the only way to, to like kind of build it back up. Right. And um, so my, <laughs> I guess my experience, my advice would be to like one stop, stop, stop pushing forward and start getting better right now. Right. Stop thinking about management. Stop thinking about uh, being an art director. Stop thinking about being a salon owner and just get better in the moment. Right. And then that stuff will happen organically if it's supposed to happen. But what I'm seeing is everybody's pushing it five, 10 years ahead of the time that they're supposed to. And, and then they know nothing about ownership. They're just the only reason their salons stay open is because they're behind the chair. Well, you know, like what happens? What happens if you can never work again? Right. Like not many people have key man insurance. I mean, it, it's so rare and it's really bloody expensive. Right. I, I looked into it for myself once and and it's just not possible. Right. So <laughs> you might be able to get a couple months of, of an injury. But what happens if you're like injured for good? You're done. There's right. no more industry. <clears throat> right. So what I'll say is you're in a village on purpose because you take they take care of each other. Right. Yeah. Like so 
one, stop looking at it like this is a bad thing. It's not, it's a really good thing. You're, you're, you're like, if someone in our shop has an issue, we all chip in to help them out, right? Like if someone's kid, they have clients and, and their kid is sick at school, someone like an apprentice will go get them, right? Like that's, you know, and we have a big salon, like we have a gym in our salon. We have a, a, a big waiting area. We have a pool table in, in our back room, you know, like we have a big salon. So if, if someone's kid isn't, doesn't uh, have to go to school that day or sick that day, they just hang out in the back and chill. Like that you, that's not something you're going to get from these other things. And, you know, each other, the group is holding each other responsible responsible for getting better for showing up to work for being there for the guests for treating the guests uh with quality for treating each other with quality right it's our job as an industry and i'll, I'll leave it with this i'll say the most important job for all hairdressers getting into this industry is to get along with others period up up the chain down the chain um and, and across it to the guests you know mm, it's it, good like that is a hundred percent where everyone needs to start and if they start there they'll have a good career and if you don't listen to this because you're young and, and you know, like you're going to learn it one way or the other, um, you know, either, either you'll let people who are older than you have been down this road, teach you or society will teach you. Right. Um, th there is no other way. No, that's good. Yep. Well, uh, there's a Chinese proverb that says a wise man learns from his own mistakes or sorry, a fool, a fool learns from his own mistakes and a wise man learns from others. I, I think talking to older people is like one of the highlights of my life. And it's weird that like when you're young and people are young, they like almost look at like the older people before them don't have any idea what they're talking about or that they themselves were never young. It, it, it's in that proverb is everything. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, next time we talk, I definitely want to open up, uh, expand on a few, few things that you touched on, but <laughs> This was a great, uh, great chance to hear a dynamic uh, story and career path. And I think there's a lot of uh, value in here for a lot of these rising and transforming stylists. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, go out there and be the best stylist you can be. Everything else will, it'll happen in its, in its time. Nice. Awesome. Have well, a thanks, good one. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, everybody, if you're following us on listening on podcast, please give us a rating. Uh, five stars is preferable, obviously. Please also follow us. If you're watching on YouTube or Instagram, please subscribe or follow or like, leave a comment, help support the channel. It doesn't cost you anything. And until next time, take care.